this same Jesus. I don't know about you, but I have already had church today. And I have a debt to Brother John Trusty, pastor of this choir. And now I'm going to say that I am jealous. <laughs> For it is the electricity that enables me to stand here before you and say this same Jesus that comes from knowing that yes, I'm, I can almost see Jesus pointing to the Father and saying is it time? We call ourselves Adventists because we are looking forward to the return of someone who has already been here. And it was that person that was being enveloped in clouds slowly that his disciples were losing sight of. And so the comforting words of those two men in white were this same Jesus will come again in like manner. <laughs> uh, you know, there are some people who think he's going to come in a very sort of secret backdoor manner. <laughs> I've got news for them. <laughs> those shining angels told his disciples, yes. he is going to come in the clouds of glory, yes. and people are going to be looking up, and the clouds are going to part, yes. and the king of glory is going to come back. Yes. It was tough. It was tough for them to say goodbye. Yes. They needed that comfort, and yea, we have needed that comfort all of our lives too. Amen. Amen. Some of us have followed Jesus all our lives. Some of us have followed him in the Adventist church all our lives. And we have been looking forward all our lives to Jesus coming back. Amen. Amen. He told his disciples, you will be my witnesses. Amen. Amen. And he told them in the context of a question <coughs> which I will likely touch on now and maybe touch on further in the future, and that is in verse 8 of the first chapter of Acts, we hear his disciples asking him one last question. Jesus, when are you going to make Israel great again? I, I, I never read that text without being totally dumbfounded. And the next second after that feeling of dumbfoundedness washes over me, I am in the realization that maybe I too have asked that same question. Jesus, Jesus does not answer that question. He deflects. You could say he's a good politician. However, he does know and is part of and is one of the Godhead and they, they together have made this plan and he plays a role and God the Father plays a role and he says, this is not my piece of this plan. This is up to the Father and he will say because it's his business. Yes. Now you know that Jesus and the Father are one because he said when he was just a young strapping lad to his mother who asked him, why did you leave us? Why didn't you come with us? He says, mom, don't you want me to be about my father's business? So he says to his disciples who are uh, uh, wanting to know when their ideas of the kingdom of heaven will be fulfilled based on the baggage that they carried. They were Israelites after all. The chosen people. 
chosen by God to show the rest of the world what it was like to live in community with him. They had been taught this from the beginning. And now Jesus was saying, not yet. But I want you to be part of what I am going to make next. I want you to be my witnesses. It was very kind. I, I, I feel this response from Jesus was very kind. Because he could have said, I'm about to leave. <laughs> and this is the question you're asking me? Have you not noticed anything about what I have done or how I have done it and to whom I have done it? Without respect to persons, nationalities, or creed, or anything, including Samaritan women. Mm -hmm. He could have said that, but he didn't. He just said, no, it's, it's not my business. It's not my peace. The Father will determine when that moment is. So thank you for that song. Yeah. Because that is the hope that burns within all of our hearts that God will play his part and say, Jesus, go get him. Yes, that's why I'm an Adventist. <laughs> and that's what I'm looking forward to, is to, to tell people that there is a God who loves every single human being on planet Earth and that he is longing to come and get us, to send his son to come and get us and all those, those glorious angels who have been watching over us, who are here this morning worshiping with us. As, as, as one inspired writer has said, uh, fanning, fanning away the clouds of darkness with their wings. You wonder why some of them have six wings? Well, maybe that's what they use one pair for. You know, you know fan away the clouds of darkness while we are in the presence of Almighty God. Witnesses go to many different events. Some witnesses gathered recently, like last Sunday, to watch my daughter say, I do. And to watch my new son, God bless him, <laughs> say, I do. And they did. And now I'm praying that those same angels that watch, have watched over them ever since their uh, tiny tots will continue to watch over them as they're on their honeymoon. God wants us to be his witnesses. That means a, a very important part of that is that we need to be watching what is going on. That being the witness in the stand doesn't mean that you are the focus of the attention. You are there to say, I was there. I witnessed the event. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promised gift. And, and, and my friends, I, I want you to know that the difference between the question that is asked in Acts chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 and the way in which Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, the only way to explain that difference is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So if, if you come here today and you un understand that, uh, that you know, coming to church is a good thing and and, and, and so you're trying to impress God by coming to church. I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to tell you that I'm sad for you. Glad that you got to hear the choir. Glad that you got to see the children coming to Jesus. Glad that you maybe got a good handshake and a happy Sabbath. But I'm certainly hopeful that you came because you wanted to be witness to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Not just that, but that you wanted it to be part.
part of your life. You wanted it to be something that motivates you. He wants to be your motivation. He wants to be that which uh, enables you to do the job that God is asking you to do. You hear Peter asking in Acts 1.8, when are you going to make Israel great? And by chapter 2, he is saying, this Jesus, whom you crucified, is the Savior of mankind. How do I know that? I know that because the Holy Spirit told me. The Holy Spirit has now changed me and given me the authority mm-hmm. to tell you that there is only one name under heaven mm-hmm. by which you can be saved. Yes. And you killed him. So it, it's no wonder that the first question that all of these God fearing Jewish people that have gathered for this event, Pentecost, from all nations. All tongues say to them in their own language, what must we do to be saved? And the witnesses speak up and say, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Be baptized. Reborn. So here's how it works. Matthew 28 says that we are to go into all the world. I want not to dwell on this, but to just remind us that this is a game changer. Israel was a y'all come experiment by God. You read in the Psalms about going up to Jerusalem. The Psalms of Ascent, like 121. 122. But Jesus says, y'all, go. Joe and I were talking in the foyer this morning. He wants to know, how do I share what I believe with other people? Right, Joe? Because Jesus said, go. So I I just told him to go to Starbucks. (laughs) Now, Uh, It doesn't have to be Starbucks. It it, it can be any other gathering place, any other watering hole where the people in that area gather because where the people gather, that's where Jesus is going to be. And if we want to go and be his witnesses, we are going to want to go and stand beside him while he is trying to contact these people. And maybe he'll nudge us and say, talk to that one over there. The game change is not about come, even though we still love to say, oh, we would love people to come to church. We must understand that God changed the the, the paradigm that he uses, the strategy that he uses when Jesus says in Matthew 28, go into all the world. That can be personalized, if you would like, witnesses, to say, go into your world. God is calling you to go into the world that you occupy and to be his witness. I was able to see many friends at the wedding that we just attended, which I participated in gladly. And uh, reports are, are coming in that I, I, I did a, an okay job and, and I didn't embarrass my daughter. <laughs> that, that really was my top goal. <laughs> you know, when you have your, your one and only daughter standing in front of you and uh, you know that her future mother-in-law is worried that you are going to say something that just might embarrass her, <laughs> you, you want to make sure that that you come across in a way that that just makes her breathe a sigh of relief and smile a very satisfied smile. (laughs) This daughter, this new daughter of mine is going to be okay and her her father, he's okay too. He's okay. 
we want to be the witnesses to what God is doing. So here's how it works. First of all, there's a gift involved. Again, I refer to the difference between Peter in the beginning of Acts and then in Acts chapter 2. He had accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, means that he becomes your personal operational officer. Okay? We talk about this in corporate terms. We can talk also about personal terms. He becomes the director of your life. You can use many words to describe director, mentor, a uh, person who gives the orders, uh, you know, chief executive. He is the one who sets in motion the transformation that we have talked about many times maybe in your life or maybe you're hearing about it for the first time that he says, I would like to transform your mind. We live in a computer age, so why don't we just say, I need to reformat your hard drive. Because the hard drive is built to do certain things and it's only going to do those things when you give it the command. It's only going to spit out what it is programmed to do. Unless you get a virus. I think that happened back in the Garden of Eden, don't you? That worm got right in there and destroyed our uh, ability to understand and connect. So God has... has come to this earth with a plan, his name is Jesus Christ, and he comes and he reformats our hard drive so that we can help others to know that connecting with God gives us true humanity. Not this degraded stuff. Not this stuff that spits out all kinds of things that hurt, malign. That is the word we use, right, when people get cancer? Malignant. That is what we want to see cut out of people when they go to surgery for cancer. Have we ever thought about words that might cause cancer? Malignant. I know about it because cancer was a part of my daddy's life. It's what killed him. But we can be part of that if we are not careful to allow our minds to be changed so that what comes through does not malign and hurt. Malignancy has an evil intent. It wants to kill. He comes in and he transforms our system. He, he becomes the system's operator and as a result of that what comes out of us is blessed by God, is helpful. Big word for me. I don't know about you. It's a big word for me. Helpful. Is what I do, is what I think, is how I act as a witness for Jesus Christ helpful to what he is doing on behalf of all humanity? I was talking to Mrs. Davidson this morning and, 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 and we decided that that maybe the focus, maybe the refocus that we need to think of as Christians today is not what God is doing for me, but what is happening to God with all that is happening in our world today. How does he feel about it? What's going on in his heart? What, what is he up to? In other words, instead of focusing on what we do or how we feel, we're focusing on how God is feeling. I think that happens more and more as the Holy Spirit becomes louder and more, more, more of our operational officer in our minds. Our minds are changed. So, number one, we have to accept the gift of the Holy Spirit to be our, our mental leader. If we want success as witnesses, we are going to need to be out there. We're going to need to be doing what God has wanted us to do. We are not just citizens of a, a particular country. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The operating system, as we have talked about in previous times, the operating system that God has given to us is love. Uh, I, I, was, I was talking with, with Milt 
yesterday and we, we decided that there is another word that you hear at weddings. Love may be the operating system, but he, we, we also talk in the vows, maybe if you're married you can remember back to that, it'll, it, it'll be uh, quite a few years uh, it, it, next month for Chris and I, and uh, darling, I know exactly how many. Uh, and and we, we hear that word not just love, but we hear cherish. Okay? The operating system once implanted in us of love causes us to cherish or to pay attention to and to, to nurture all of those things that I think are embodied in that word cherish, the people that God points us towards to be witnesses to. So when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses and we accept, we are accepting to live now hold on, you ready? You, your seats, you've got your seat belts on? We are accepting the unselfish life. It's tough. I'm just going to tell you, it's tough for me, and I think it's tough for everyone. We are accepting the unselfish life in a world that runs on selfishness. Uh, that's very plain language. I, I hope it doesn't hurt but yet I hope it sticks. This is impossible, I believe, to complete uh, this operational change. And so Paul tells us that if we want this unselfishness in our lives, we must have the mind of Christ. We cannot claim, in some respects, to be his witnesses unless we are willing to live the unselfish life. Amen. Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain. I don't know if you like this one like I do, but it goes perfectly along with what I'm saying right now. Let no debt remain outstanding. And that's, uh, that, that, that's good economic advice right now. Except, Paul always has exceptions, except the continuing debt to love one another for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Amen. Now I understand the law is the law of love. The summation of the law, according to Jesus, is love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your neighbor as yourself, your fellow man as yourself. And how you do it is how you cherish each other. So I say let's, let's continue, let's continue to be in debt to each other. It will be the evidence that we are living the unselfish life that Jesus came to show us, and it will be the, the way in which we can also show that the Spirit of God is infilling our lives and is pushing us forward. I love this church. I love being, I love this congregation in specific. I'm, when I say church, I'm thinking of the Adventist movement. And I believe that God has some amazing days in front of us. Amen. How we execute the orders of the Holy Spirit in the next few days, in the next weeks and months, here in the Pacific Union, of the North American Division, of the World Church of Seventh-day Adventists, how we go about doing that will show whether or not we are in Acts chapter 1, or whether we have had the infilling of the Holy Spirit and we have now become Acts chapter 2 kind of people. Amen. You know what the, the summation of it is? When you go to see whether or not you've done enough, whether or not you're finished with what you need to do, you know what comes in Acts chapter 2? I'm, I'm amazed by this. You can read the description there of all of the things that the people had in common and all of the things that they did with each other as a community of faith. And then it says this, the grade that they get from the people in that community, not a single person had anything bad to say about that new church. Not a single one in all of Jerusalem they believed that what had just happened 
not only was miraculous, but that it, it, it was something that was drawing them in. 3,000 in the first day, and then many, many hundreds and thousands of people after that. I am convinced, my friends, that when we follow Jesus' uh, plea to us to lift him up by the power of the Holy Spirit and say that the, the love life, the unselfish life, is the only way to survive and, in fact, is the root and bedrock of God's kingdom, Amen. that people will say, I want some of that. Amen. What must we do to inherit a place in that family. May God richly bless us as this week we implore the Holy Spirit to give us the power to live the unselfish life. Amen. Amen.